Uh, okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Rodrigo Pena and I am a PhD candidate at the University of Sao Paulo and I'm working under supervision of Professor Antonio Roque. So um, I want first, of course, to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me and please interrupt me at any moment. Um, uh, my talk here goes on the lines of differences between uh, stochastic and deterministic spiking neural network models. And I would like to start with this idea that we are going to discuss throughout the, the presentation, that is, the brain in its many scales is certainly subjected to various sources of noise. Um, so first, uh, when we talk about scales, um, you can imagine not only uh, spatial scales, but also temporal scales. So this is a nice picture I, I always like to show you because uh, it shows how techniques have evolved since 1988 to 2014. And you can see here on the y-axis the size and then the, the x-axis the time. So for example, if you take EG and MEG, you capture something of the order of 100 um, millimeters and you see something temporarily uh, 0 0.01 uh, seconds. But if you were working with patch clamp, you capture something of this order here, dendrites more or less, and you can capture something uh, up to a few seconds. But all of that um, is inside the same system, which is uh, the brain. And not only that, but if we really want to um, understand um, complex functions, uh, sensory signals, how our brain can uh, process, uh, for example, seeing, smelling, hearing, and thinking, you can go um, uh, to much more complex things like that. We have also to understand uh, that all of that uh, is, uh, it might be uh, it is together uh, with rhythmic key and non-rhythmic fluctuations. So the, the, the signals that we observe, they are embedded with those rhythmic key and non-rhythmic fluctuations. Uh, but uh, being more specific, uh, if we start to uh, zoom in um, in a piece of the brain, uh, for example, let's talk about the cortex, we take a, a, a piece and then we go uh, zooming in, we take like a millimeter cubic, uh, you will see that those fluctuations, uh, we can actually separate uh, those uh, in different sources. Uh, we can talk, for example, uh, about network noise. So uh, if you take, for example, a millimeter uh, cubic of your cortex, we are talking about something of the order of 10,000 neurons to 100,000 neurons. And from the point of view of a neuron, you can treat so the whole connectivity that this neuron receive as a background uh, called network noise. So we can deal with that as if it was noise. Uh, but then if you go uh, even further, uh, we can see, for example, the synaptic cleft. And you observe that there, is, there are some spontaneous uh, release of neuron transmitters in the synaptic cleft, which is happening all the time. So this is also a source of noise. We, we may call that synaptic noise. But we also have channels uh, which are embedded in the membrane and those channels, they are subjected to their own fluctuations. And this is channel noise. So you see we can uh, actually distinguish between those. You may have uh, many other sources like thermal noise, for example, um, and all of that may influence the response of the neuron. Uh, so my top key here, uh, I will try to talk, uh, to, to show you a few examples of works that we have been doing and dealing with those different sources of noise. Um, I will start first talking about uh, networks that come from the deterministic side and then we add a source of noise. And then I come back with this uh, stochastic neural model which has its own intrinsic source of noise. Um, and then we see how it goes. Um, 
So uh, first of all, uh, let's talk about the basic neural model. Um, this, uh, the way I write here is, the, is like the leak integrating fire neuron. Uh, I, know, I, I think everyone uh, knows about this neuron. So you have a voltage equation, differential equation for the voltage, and you integrate that, you have a deterministic uh, increase of this voltage. You can set a threshold here, and whenever the voltage reaches the threshold, you reset. So that is embedded here in this update rule. But you may also have, for example, a U variable here, which is, I call here, a, an optional adaptive current. So you can uh, model adaptation, for example, when the firing rate increases a lot, you break the evolution of this neuron, so you can create, for example, bursting behavior and many other uh, neuronal patterns. So this uh, would be a, a basic model uh, coming from this side. Uh, now, if we want to add, for example, um, network noise, uh, a natural way to do that would be uh, simply to include this neuron in a network, and that would come naturally. So, uh, the whole background that is delivered to this uh, neuron uh, comes here at the input, and this would uh, also uh, this would model the network noise. But we could go further, and we want, for example, to model model uh, other parts of the brain, um, uh, but this might become complicated because of simulation costs, for example. Um, instead of modeling many, many other areas, we could, for example, add uh, Poisson spike trains. And we say, okay, those Poisson spike trains are actually uh, modeling what comes from uh, whatever, uh, any other places from the brain. Um, now, if we want to talk about synaptic noise, uh, we need some synaptic current, and a way, and that synaptic current, um, it's a current that is injected from your presynaptic neuron to your postsynaptic neuron when there is a spike. Uh, you may have some conductance here, and in this conductance here, you add a stochastic process. So uh, this is just an example of how modeling synaptic noise, uh, we, we use this. Uh, I will show you uh, what, what, uh, what are the effects that it, this can do uh, on the network level, for example, but just for you to have an idea. Uh, but uh, then you may also have the channel noise. Um, I, I think, to me, it's a bit complicated to talk about channel noise if we're not talking about uh, Hodgkin-Huxley equations because th those are, uh, you are actually modeling the channels. I know that there are other simple models that can do that, but uh, the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, you have uh, equations for each channel. For example, this is the sodium, this is the potassium, and you have those gating variables there, and you can add some source of noise inside the gating variables. So this would be a way of doing that. So here you will see that you are actually on a different level. We are talking about really the subunit of the channel here, which is different than, uh, than here where you talk about the synaptic level or here when we are including the noise on the, uh, coming from the network. Um, but um, what's interesting is that uh, those sources of noise, you can look um, uh, I mean, there is a minor source of noise, there is a major source of noise, but this can actually cause some effect as well. Uh, channel noise is a very minor uh, source of noise, uh, but uh, people have been doing experiments where they completely isolate the neuron and they uh, apply some constant current over and over again, but still they get some uncertainty on the threshold. The spiking times here are not all the same. This is what we may call as trial to trial variability. So you inject the same current uh, to the same neuron uh, several times and you don't observe a deterministic behavior. So channel noise can, uh, is a part of, is a, is, a, is a source of noise that can influence this effect. So there are some effects that we can observe from this noise. Uh, okay, so um, apart from those introductions, I, I will now show um, uh, some examples of how we deal with that. 
So first, I uh, will tell you about the um, um, uh, work that we have tried to approach network noise. So the idea was um, to think and or to try to achieve what was the noise received by a neuron as if this neuron were in a network. So uh, we started here as a nice setup, so to say. So it's a homogeneous, large, and sparse network, uh, very large, and where uh, the activity is asynchronous and irregular. So in this setup, uh, we, have, um, uh, we have a condition uh, which we can use, which is the self-consistency that is generated by this neuron. It means that uh, every neuron that you pick in this network is statistically the same. So the input that comes to this neuron should be more or less the same as the output. So this is uh, the self-consistency. And there is a nice procedure uh, that we have developed with our partners in, um, in Germany, which is uh, this iterative scheme, uh, which can be used to approach this network noise in the self-consistent condition. So we start with a base key model, um, and then you inject some noise. It doesn't matter the, the initial noise that you inject to this neuron. So here I'm showing you the power spectra of this noise. And you see that it's flat, it's a uh, white noise. Uh, and we call this the zero generation. Uh, the thing is that the injected current here uh, has the same prefactors, I mean the same number uh, that of connection that it would receive from the network. I, I have to multiply that here. Uh, but then the output generated here by this neuron, you see that's no longer white. You have some uh, small deep here and lower frequencies. Uh, but then you take this, uh, what we call the first generation, and you apply this again to the uh, second generation of neurons. And you do this procedure iteratively over and over again until you reach, uh, reach a self-consistent condition, which is uh, the input statistics are equal to the output statistics. So in this way, uh, we can um, approximate the network noise that is being delivered to this neural model. And we have done that in several cases. Um, this is a, a famous network that from Brunel and Ostoik. Uh, but uh, uh, um, I just wanted to show that, uh, that the, the noise that we approximate with this simple iterative scheme is the same as the network noise. So uh, the dots and squares here, uh, in every of those cases here where I am increasing the synaptic weight, so J is the synaptic weight, um, it, it's, uh, it's identified here and it's al always very close to the network, uh, to the iterative scheme, which is showed in solid lines here. So you can see those uh, many different uh, behaviors. Here we have homogeneous AI and heterogeneous AI. Uh, but, but the important message here is that we can get this uh, uh, only simulating one uh, single neuron. Uh, we have also worked with some more heterogeneous networks and with, with some few extensions we can capture the same network noise, uh, for example, with different populations and different models. So, uh, uh, I mean, for this work, I guess that the take home message is that, um, uh, I mean, there is a network noise, which is uh, by far non Poissonian. So you can see here that the power spectrum is of the spike trains are, is not flat. And uh, which is uh, the same as observed in experimental setups. Um, Okay, so this is just a summary of this work. So network noise is non-Poissonian. You can get um, this by using this iterative self-consistent scheme uh, with very high accuracy. Uh, so a second work that we, uh, um, we, we, we did uh, is uh, regards the synaptic noise. So um, in this case here, those are, um, those are uh, deterministic setups, and so far we don't have noise. Uh, the, those are random networks, and I'm working here with the easy capture neural model. Uh, 
so it contains that adaptive variable that I was uh, telling you at the beginning, and we have some mixtures of neurons. Uh, but that, that I mean, uh, importantly, that the important thing in this case is that uh, whenever the in inhibitory conductance exceeds the excitatory conductance, we have some oscillatory behavior, and and this is noiseless activity so far. I'm, I'm not showing talking about noise. Uh, interestingly, the, the activity of those uh, neurons, I mean, if you take the voltages and you plot a histogram, you see that we have a bimodal distribution here. And this is actually very close to uh, experiments involving slow wave sleep, uh, where we have those up and down states. So the net, the, the, the voltage is actually fluctuating between a hyperpolarized and a depolarized state. Uh, uh, markedly, when we include some synaptic noise on this um, uh, network, we get a totally different behavior. So you see that uh, we, we don't see the uh, oscillatory behavior. Uh, no longer there is only uh, asynchronous, irregular behavior. Uh, you have neurons spiking here and there, but and if you look to the voltage, there it's more or less concentrated close to the resting state. So noise here, uh, in this case, I'm talking about very weak noise, which was delivered, and uh, you see how the the, the activity, uh, which was not achieve it before uh, appears in this case. But then um, if you start to increase this uh, level of noise uh, systematically, uh, we actually recover that oscillatory activity. But it comes at the price that uh, you have some um, uh, intermittency of activities. Not only the oscillatory activity, but you also have the asynchronous irregular activity here. So uh, noise, in this case, allows a transition between this very, um, uh, this uh, quiescent periods, as we call, to that active periods. And we have been, we studied this um, uh, 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 with many other measurements, and we saw that uh, the level of noise can actually um, control the, the resilience state uh, the resilience time on those uh, active and quiescent periods. So this is an example how synaptic noise can act in uh, on the network level. So synaptic noise is actually uh, embedded on the synaptic left, and we can see how this can control the the, the networks. Uh, in this case, of course, that we have a neural model with adaptation. So this should work fine if you are working with a neural model which contains adaptation. Um, okay, so yeah, synaptic noise allows intermittency and we have a connection between the neuronal level to the network level. So now going to the stochastic model, um, I guess Guilherme gave already a very nice introduction to that. Uh, but this is the version uh, we will be using here. Uh, and it contains this phi of v, uh, which is the vote independent probability. Uh, and I will be basically uh, talking about the simplified ver version from Ludmilla and Ariadne um, and Koki and everyone else. Uh, so, uh, it's very important um, at the first moment to determine the phi of phi. I mean, uh, of course, and uh, you can imagine that the phi of phi can uh, change a lot the behavior of this neuron. So we have employed this method, uh, which uh, it's not our method, but some people have used it before, which is a way to determine this uh, probability function here. Uh, and it fo it follows like this. So you get in A here a uh, voltage series, and you ident identify in this voltage series the peaks, the action potentials, and you grab a window uh, with a certain delta t before those peaks. 
And in this window, uh, you have a window here and a window in every peak. Uh, and in this window here, you identify the maximum curvature, which this is uh, what we call, we will call like that our uh, threshold, which is V star here. So you hold that in one hand and in another hand, you create a voltage series with those windows, but without all values above V star. And uh, you have those uh, in your, in your one in one hand and another in one hand. So one with the V stars and another with all those windows. And you create histograms, one with those new voltage series without the values above V star and another with all the values of the curvatures. So with that, if you compute the ratio between those histograms, you have a far probability of this phi of phi. Uh, okay, I don't know if it was clear enough, but um, no one asked it. <laughs> okay, so um, I mean, we interestingly, uh, I, we have done that with data, I'm going to show you, but um, a nice uh, phi of phi is this sigmoidal function, um, which approximates very well uh, the, the, with this ratio of histograms. So uh, we have, of course, probed this method. I mean, this was uh, artificially generated with this, the, the stochastic model. I mean, we simply uh, uh, produced artificial data with some, um, I mean, many phi of phi's. We changed this here and there. And we use it, the method to see if the non phi of phi is uh, well approximated by this fitted phi of phi using this method. So it, it seems to be quite okay. Uh, but, and it, I mean, it's very accurate. Um, so uh, the first thing that we did with this idea was to um, simulate. Um, Hodgkin Huxley models. Uh, so this, in this case, we use it, this this taxi. Uh, he con he has uh, some uh, uh, well approximated um, uh, uh, models for different electrophysiological classes, so different firing patterns, and we use that to approximate different phi of phi's. It's very interesting because um, in this case here, we as you see here that the difference between a regular spiking. And a fast spiking here is just that uh, the inclination and the value of v half, which is the value of phi of v equals to half here. So uh, I, I think that this is actually an advantage of this model because if you want to model those firing patterns with Hodgkin Huxley model, I mean, you have several parameters which you have to take care, but here we have only two. And we can get, I mean, those are, uh, I'm just comparing here the FI curves for, yeah? When you say what you mean conductance, conductance space. Conductance yeah. Um, so here I'm just comparing the FI curves and you can see that um, it, it approximates well um, those two models only the, the, with the only change of move, moving this inclination, which uh, consequently moves also the value of E half. Uh, uh, and I mean, this is just to tell you that this model, um, when simulated alone, it has some trial to trial variability, which is close to what we observe for the general noise experiments that I was telling you at the beginning. But if you start to increase some current to this model, you'll get um, more or less um, deterministic behavior, probably because it, it starts uh, to care less about the uh, firing probability or because you drag it to high voltage very fast. Uh, but uh, we asked a few colleagues to do some patch clump experiments, and I guess that this is uh, the link to neurobiology because if we, we had a model, we developed a, a way to uh, get to approximate this phi of phi. And now um, I think that it's better instead of comparing it with other models like Hodgkin Huxley to go to real experiments like uh, patch clamp experiments. 
And so those are recordings, uh, spontaneous activity of uh, pyramidal neurons. And we, we took a lot of data and we started to employ this method, locating those maximum curvatures and checking, uh, 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 fitting a V of V. And for this neuron, we, get, we got some uh, good fitting. So K equals 1.28 and V half equals minus 48.4. So this would be um, uh, the fitted data. And with that, we thought about including the model um, to, to, to modeling a network. So the first, um, um, uh, I think that the, the, the first approach would be to model a standard network. Uh, um, I, I know most of you are uh, know this one from Brunel 2000. So it's just a fixed in degree network. Uh, you have uh, of the order of 10,000 neurons, homogeneous population. So every neuron receives the same number of connections, and you have the same the same copies of the same neuron. And you have an excita excitatory to inhibitory ratio of of the um, four to one, and this also goes to the connection ratio. And, and here we have some parameters. Um, but OK, this, this is a diagram of how the activity changes. Uh, in this case, I'm measuring um, firing rate of the, 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 the average firing rate of the network. And this star here is the fitted value uh, for the, uh, with the experiments. And as you move k to the, the to a high limit here, you see that the phi function, uh, that the soft threshold becomes a hard threshold. So we are actually going towards the deterministic side. And there we can see uh, how, how, uh, how this changes on the network level. So uh, you see that different regimes uh, regarding here firing rate are possible. And this is also uh, very affected by the input. Uh, those are uh, raster plot examples. Uh, it's very interesting uh, to see that uh, there are some oscillations here uh, in the deterministic model. And those oscillations, uh, they somehow vanish in, the, in, this, um, um, in the case of the uh, stochastic neural model, at least the one that was fitted so uh, to us, it, it, I mean, there um, one can hypothesize. Uh, no, there are still, yeah, 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 they, 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 of course, yeah. Maybe it's too, too tough to say that. But they, uh, you don't have those uh, very, those, those big oscillations here. Um, and this is also, um, th you can also observe that on the, uh, population power spectra, where, which is less picket. I mean, it's not only the firing rate that moves, but it seems that the communication is a little bit different um, um, on this uh, with using this neural model. Uh, for, we also took, for example, Mutu information, um, uh, which was taken uh, among different pairs of neurons. So here you have the average of 200 randomly selected pairs. And you see that as we go towards the deterministic side, we have a degree of the dependency between those neurons increasing. And to, to the other side, we have less dependency. Uh, we have also employed the iterative scheme uh, to this uh, neural model, uh, which was uh, I, might be a good idea because this is a way of connecting network noise to a neuron that already has its own intrinsic noise, right? And uh, we see uh, what happens to that. So in the case of k equals 5, we have a very good agreement uh, with the simulations of the network. And then there are some tiny disagreements here uh, on the peaks of the k equals to 1.28. Uh, this is still under discussion. I'm just showing you. Uh, so uh, maybe we can discuss about that. But I know that there was some idea of doubling of stochasticity uh, that came out. And 
it might be that, that the intrinsic noise here is being doubled uh, with some network noise and but um, network is certainly affected by this soft threshold uh, I mean I started the, 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 the talk dividing uh, different sources of noise uh, uh, but I cannot conclude saying which is the source of noise of this neural model uh, but uh, what we saw is that it certainly affects at the network lo level. Uh, it might be that this noise comes from different sources or it's a part of different sources like channel noise. But we know, for example, that channel noise also affects subthreshold behavior, which is uh, not included in the model. Uh, but uh, um, I mean, that the, the message is that we are trying to uh, find answers. We are looking into experiments and we think that this method is nice because we can now fit we can you see we can make the link to the other side to the neurobiological side so we can ask for experiments we can model the neuron and we can test and ask people to test different things on the model on, on the neurons and then we check with the model uh, so those are the people who participated on this uh, on this work. So I wanted to say thanks to them. So Professor Antonio, he's, uh, he was involved in all different uh, parts of this work. And Vinicius and Hena, they are actually following us through the cameras right now. But uh, Vinicius is in France and Hena is in Yulish, working with Professor Marcos Dismond. Uh, and Fernanda is also working with this Stokaski model. Uh, Fernando, Guilherme and Cesar, they are providing data for us. Uh, Newton is also working with the Stokaski model. Uh, Sebastian as well, so there are a lot of people working with the Stokaski model. And Professor Michel was working with the Synapke noise stuff. So, thank you very much. Uh, In the last part of your talk, you showed this um, experimental data where you um, fitted your response function. And then you, as I understood, you used the neuron model with this response function in a recurrent network. And you saw some discrepancies, right? Between the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and on, on the other hand, we know that stochastic models can be uh, very well fitted to these recurrent networks if the uh, linear response of the stochastic models is is adjusted to the to the working point that you have in the deterministic version so so the um, the experiments were done in a slice is that right yeah yeah so if i i would assume that if you take um, um, in vivo data yeah where, where the where the real neuron is also in a in a working network setting and you would fit the response functions to this situation, that then the um, agreement would be much better. So I, uh, I, I understand that depending on the situation you get the data from, you, will, you might end up with a different fitting, and this influences the network, like in vivo, in vitro, and so on and so forth. I see. OK, thank you. In the very, at the very beginning, you said that just adding a tiny bit of noise changes completely the the character of the simulation. I mean, but so that that means that to me that uh, that tiny bit of noise is not so tiny bit. I mean, there must be some gradual. If you added even less noise, at some point you should be able to see the transition between the two regimes, right? So. Uh, have you tried to see exactly where and how uh, one regime changes into the other one? I mean, between those two, go, you see what I mean, right? Uh, uh, you, you added a little bit of noise and you saw a completely...
Okay. And you had oscillations again. at the beginning, and then you added a tiny bit of noise, and the oscillations disappeared. Ah, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, I, I got <laughs> it. It's the, the synaptic noise work. Yeah, we, we have the transitions. I mean, there is a transition region between those two. Uh, we have investigated that as well. That's, that's of course, true. Ah, uh, okay. some measure that we chose, we were able to sketch a diagram showing the, the region where the transition will occur. And now we are investigating uh, whether in that region we have avalanches and things that would uh, correspond to critical behavior. So I'll mention briefly that in my talk in this afternoon. So, so you are invited to his talk in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. How do you justify the synaptic noise you uh, you used? I mean, I, I I saw that that was from this text. So how does the Godfather justify it? Because that doesn't fit what you see in experiments. That's the point. So synaptic noise should comes from this uh, your uh, spontaneous release of neuron transmitters, which is always present. Uh, it's, not, it's not the spontaneous release. I mean, you, 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 it's you repeat a, it's a the release, you have fluctuations. It's not, it's not linked to... But you may also, this is one part, you may also have failure of synaptic synapt communication. Yeah, yeah, but, but you won't capture that with uh, uh, oh, you SD. You but with SD, you're using, it's not capturing this effect. You, you're just, uh, at every time point, you're you adding some white noise, I mean, some, some Gaussian noise. It's not what goes on in a real synapse. Well, I, I don't know what you mean. I mean, you have, of course, a certain a, a, a large amount of release of neuron transmitters, and you have different sources along the dendrite and the axons, and all of those sources can sum up, for example, to the limit central theorem, which becomes a Gaussian. And then you can so then you're not precise enough. So yeah. at what point are you wh when you describe a synapse? So it's it's for a specific pair of neuron or it's I mean, no, how? it's not for a pair. It's it would it it's like you have um, a large amount of um, connections come to the coming to this neuron, and each of each one of those can become a source of noise. So if you sum up all of that, you end up with a source of Gaussian noise in the background. So how did you do the simulations where you studied the effect of synaptic noise? So in my case, I include on the, on the conductances. So how do you, you have a delta that, that appears. So if you go back to the. Okay, there is a delay to come back. This? Yes. So, the TIs, where do they come from? Which? TI. TI. So, the delta of T minus TI. Ah, those are the synapses that when you have a presynaptic pre spike, you inject some delta here. So, I. It's the time of a presynaptic spike. Yeah, exactly. So that's a spike from a neuron that you're simulating. Yeah, exactly. So then, I don't agree. I mean, that's, that's not what we see in experiments. I'm not really I mean, what the, a more proper way to, to, to describe what goes on would be to put noise on G. You want to include the noise on no, no, G? I mean, is that what uh, the main noise source is here. You, I mean, excitatory to inhibitory? Yeah? Yeah, the, the, the increments that you add, at 
each synapse you have a ah I, I that yeah that sometimes you have okay. some small increment or, 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 okay. or decrement depending on the synapse and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you see. Yeah. You can also okay. see the demand in the in the first yeah. sketches where you were describing the three different sorts of noise, right? You mm. but you 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 have the drawing of these basic of these um basicals. Yeah. No, Yeah, I'm, I'm trying, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's not. You see here, there are, there are vesicles, right? But yeah. You're choosing the membrane. And I think Christopher's point is that it's quantum. Yes. Right? Yeah. So if you either have fusion or not, and so you actually there are big differences on, 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 the, on the gene. Okay, you can, of course, make the model more complicated because this is an effect realistic. And, or realistic so to say but this is this was not considered I, I know this effect that you have different amplitudes for example when you do a patch clamp experiment and if you start to record the spontaneous EPSPs or IPS, uh, EPSCs the currents you, you really observe this difference not only on the amplitudes but also for example in other variables like rise time and decay time, you can actually measure that, but that's not included on this model. If that answers the question, yes and no. Okay. Yeah, so the model is not the proper, the, the best yeah. fit that was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we know that there are better models, but uh, this is a model which is used. So people like the stats here and other people have used. So as an exercise, we decided Wouldn't to use. Wouldn't these be equivalent to one uh, to one another? Wouldn't these um, Gaussian increments that you do in the synaptic in the in the differential equation for G wouldn't be equivalent to making the G parameter fluctuate? Because when the G parameter fluctuate, you're just adding a little bit more of the delta, and then it would be equivalent to say that there is a Gaussian noise there that increments a little bit more of the delta or a bit less of the data. Mm -hmm. Well, in the way it's, it's modeled here, you can jump from one level to the next. Okay. But I'm, I'm not saying that it's. It doesn't have a large effect, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you will have or a different effect, in my opinion. All these questions we can answer now because we have computers. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. You just uh, build a model that is built in yeah. more detail and then you compare. So you should ask the computer, not me. <laughs> Yes, no, kidding. We, we, we have <laughs> no, I have to do it. Yeah, you're right. I'm just joking. Okay. And also, this goes to the channel noise. I mean, the one I presented here is just an example, but there are several ways to do it. You don't. Sometimes I saw people including here together with the gatings, or you could actually include as a time dependent. Um, noise here to the voltage so there are several ways and to take care of reality uh, yeah but to a certain uh, again level. that's uh, you have some lazy people who are doing what is written here and you have some people who've been working pretty hard to figure out what goes on yeah and yeah, so yeah. And ju just injecting gaussian noise i mean yeah, <sighs> uh, yeah you say you inject noise in the model but you I, i'm not sure you you've you've if you look at, at actual data, that, that won't fit what goes on. Yeah, this, uh, uh, this, if this is a nice review. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Know that's, 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 so they say exactly that, what you're saying. So at the beginning, people were just putting noise everywhere and see how this compares to data. Uh, but not all models are OK. Most of them are nonsense, so to say. So I mean, and modeling progress in a in a, sequ in a sequence of approximations. So we we, I mean, we wanted to start an investigation using some say noisy term added to the synaptic equation, not to the con to the voltage equation. So that's the starting. We, we know that synaptic noise model that is wrong. We know that there are better models. So so then my critic is. Uh, if you run large simulations like that, 
uh, you have lots of uh, different features in the, the output. The question is, if you don't specify the feature you're interested in before you do the simulation, you're very likely to find something interesting regardless of the type of noise you've included. My, my, my worry is that you're exposed to uh, data dredging. Okay, that's... But, and uh, last question, um, when you do the, the stochastic uh, neuron model, it's in discrete time. But the, the simulations you showed for the galveston shaba it's discrete time. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, this was a discussion with Ozami. We had this discussion last week. Um, it might be that it also works with, but okay, continue. Just as a precision. Yeah, yeah. More questions? So, okay, thank you very much.